Before the coming of the railways, coastal shipping was vitally important as being the only practical way of moving goods, yes, and people too, around the country. The River Nith, which flows through Dumfries, offered sailings for passengers to Liverpool and Ireland, as well as cargo services to many ports in Europe. A glance at the famous Bradshaw's Guide will show that many of these coastal services persisted well into the 20th century, despite the railway having reached into every corner of the mainland. The Solway Firth is severely tidal, and the entrance to the River Nith is tricky, especially at low tide, so the approach to the estuary was marked by one of Scotland's first lighthouses, in 1749. The railway came to Dumfries from Carlisle in 1848 and the line was extended northward to Kilmarnock and Glasgow in 1850. Dumfries's importance as a seaport declined rapidly. We will only cross the River Nith twice on our northbound journey, and the first time is just a mile or so beyond our starting point, at the Four Arch Martinton Bridge, which continues as a low viaduct for a further seven arches over the low-lying ground to the north of the river. About five miles north of Martinton, the line crosses the river for the second and final time using the 2004 built Portrack viaduct, created to replace an earlier bridge which was being dangerously undercut by the river. This new bridge is claimed to be the biggest railway bridge built in Britain since the fourth bridge of 1890. For the 37 miles between Dumfries and New Cumnock, the Glasgow and South Western main line follows the River Nith, sometimes perilously closely, occasionally at a distance for reasons which will become clear. This stretch of the line has a long history of erosion and undercutting of the railway. In 2020, the entire route had to be closed for six weeks to allow the track to be made safe. North of Aldgarth, the line moves away from the river as it enters the lands of the Duke of Buccleuch, who refused to allow the railway to be built within sight of his home, Drumlanrig Castle. A four-arch viaduct was required to cross the little Campbell Water. The Duke didn't attempt to prevent the building of the railway, but merely insisted that it must not be visible from his home, the splendid Drumlanrig Castle. As we look at the magnificent surroundings, it's easy to sympathise with his point of view. The tree line marks the course of the river, so the smoke and noise of locomotives would have been all too intrusive. A lengthy deviation away from the river was required, involving the digging of a tunnel almost a mile in length. 
Since the line is in deep cuttings for a considerable distance at each end of the tunnel, railway passengers see little of the wonderful scenery surrounding them. The Nith Valley now narrows and becomes very steep-sided. Many of the small streams which flow down from the Lowther Hills have cut dramatic gorges before reaching their confluence with the main river. The Little Carron Water eventually has to be crossed by a spectacular and rather inaccessible viaduct. The railway runs high above the A76 road. Both are heavily engineered and require constant maintenance to prevent subsidence and collapse. Before the coming of the railways, the old drove roads provided the routes through the hills. The writer Daniel Defoe, widely travelled throughout Britain, declared the Entekin Pass to be one of the two most dangerous and frightening routes he had experienced. The Entekin Valley is now wild and abandoned, but at Entekin Foot, the little burn has carved out a terrifyingly deep gorge which requires a 111 foot high viaduct to carry the railway across it. Even a mountain goat will hesitate to tackle these slopes. How do the engineers access its base to inspect it? As we approach our first stop, Sanka, the Nith Valley begins to widen out. The Entekin Pass may be abandoned and wild, but the Menach Pass is still very much in use, as it leads to Scotland's highest village, One Lock Head, more than 1,500 feet above sea level. Lead, copper, zinc, silver, and some of the world's purest gold were mined here until the 1930s. A branch railway line, Scotland's highest, ran to the village from the Caledonian Railway at Elvon Foot. The track bed is still visible today. Part of the mine is open to the public in season, and the village also boasts Scotland's highest pub. Once again, a substantial viaduct is required to carry the railway over the Manic Water. <laughs> 
And so, after 26 miles, we arrive at the former mining community of Sanka. Immediately north of Sanka, yet another substantial viaduct is needed to carry the line over the Kroyak water. The Kroyak Valley provides another route through the Lauda Hills before descending into Clydesdale at Abington. The river, the road and the railway run side by side as we head towards our next destination. A short three-mile run brings us to another old mining community at Kirkano. This little unstaffed station avoided the beaching acts in the 1960s and was for a number of years the only stopping place on the entire 58 miles between Dumfries and Kilmarnock. To the north of Kirkano the character of the line changes. The valley becomes much wider and is almost a plateau on which the river meanders. We leave the train at New Cumnock because this is where the river and the railway part company. in the 1960s, but open-cast mining continued here until 2013, and there are still vestiges of the old coal sidings remaining today. And the River Nith? Well, it doesn't look much like the tidal river that flows through the centre of Dumfries. <laughs> 